Okay, and uh, welcome to the very first 3D modeling using the Maya 2018 software. Uh, this tutorial is going to be going pretty slow. It will be assuming that a lot of these things, uh, these concepts that we're going to be talking about, it, are very new to you. And so what you can actually do, since this is going to be playing on YouTube, is you can choose the speed that you hear me speak. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can actually just come over to settings, and inside of the settings you can see speed. Now by default it's normal speed, uh, but you can slow it down so you can hear me speak a little bit slower, or you can speed it up to make me speak a little faster, whichever you're more comfortable with, okay? So when you first load the Maya software, this is something that you'll be seeing. It'll be uh, this main perspective window and then a lot of different buttons surrounding it. Uh, we're not going to get into every single button. It's okay. Uh, a lot of this um, is for more advanced features, so don't feel overwhelmed by what you see. But when you're going to work inside of Maya, one of the very first things that you want to do is you want to create a Maya project. Now, a Maya project is different from just saving a file. So, for example, uh, if you're using something like Microsoft Word and you're just trying to save a document, you would just go up to the file and say save the file as and then just decide where it needs to go. But Maya doesn't work that way. Maya is the sort of software that really likes things where things should be. Um, there are a lot of different folders that get organized into specific categories, hierarchies, and fortunately the software comes with a way of making all of that all by itself. Okay, Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring this window over and you can see that it's just sitting inside of a uh, blank space. Okay, This blank space we can pretend is your external hard drive, maybe it's your thumb drive. If you're working on someone else's computer, in other words you're not working on your own computer, um, you definitely don't want to save the work onto you know, the desktop or onto the C drive. So just make sure that wherever you choose to save this is a place that you control and that you can back it up and keep it safe. Okay, So I'm going to use this space as this empty space as if it was your thumb drive or your hard drive. Okay, So I'm going to keep this over here and then I'm going to come over underneath file, instead of just where it says save the scene, I'm going to go further down until I find the project window. Okay. Now the project window is going to pop up and I'm going to choose this button right here. It says new. I want to make a new project and look, each one of these is actually one of the folders that it's going to create for me. As you can see, there are a lot of them. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to name this, I'll use my last name, and then 3D Modeling 01. Okay, so that'll be me, which class I'm in, and which assignment I'm working on. Something just like that. Then, once I've given it a name, I now have to give it a location. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to navigate over to where that folder that I created is, and it's right there, the 3D Modeling Lectures. Okay. So again, remember that that's where this is, the 3D Modeling. Remember, there's nothing in here yet. So I'll choose Select, and then as soon as I hit Accept, I'm just going to shrink this window down so that you can see what happens over here. Okay. So, I all I had to do was I had to give it a main project name and tell it where it was supposed to go. Then I hit accept. Now what the computer is going to do is it's going to make a folder for me. So it's not just one folder though. Watch this. If I open this up, this entire set of folders, this is what Maya needs to see. This is what Maya wants to work with. Okay, now the scenes folder 
this is where we'll be saving our 3D files. Uh, source images is where we'll be saving images that we've made or images that we've taken to use as textures to work inside of the program. Images will be where our final pictures, our final rendered images go. Now all of these other files, these folders you're likely not going to work with the very first time you ever use a program as sophisticated as Maya and that's okay. All right. As you get further and further in, files or folders like the cache folder, um, the data sets, the render information, uh, importing or using sound. These are things that you'll be doing but much later. Okay, So don't worry about that. The fact that all these folders are here will not impact whether you use them or not, but not having it like this, that's where the real challenge starts. So you want to make sure that every time you start a new project, that's what you do. Now, the very first time that you create one of these projects, Maya assumes that that's where you want to work since you just made it. But what happens if you've already created one of these project directories and you want to continue working in it? Well, that's what the other button in that same location is for. So again, I'm going to go to File, and that's where the Set Project goes. You click that open and you'll notice that it takes you straight to the location that the last project was. Now, even if it didn't do this, let's say that it uh, is a different day or you're on a different computer or you're now sitting down where someone else was working, that's when you'll want to set the project to your folder. Okay. Now, what that means is that you just navigate over using the set project window, and this is usually what I do. While you can simply highlight it and then hit set, I prefer to do it one step further because I like to be 100% sure that the computer can't possibly get confused. So what I'll do is I'll double click so that I'm actually inside of that and I can see all of the folders. If I can see all of these folders and I don't have any of them selected, the computer knows that it can't possibly be anywhere else but inside that project. And then I'll just hit set. Okay. So even if you already had one of these created, maybe from a different day, maybe you're on a different computer, make sure that Maya knows where you expect to get things, where it expects to save things, that's really, really important. Without that information, you're going to run into a lot of issues. All right, so now that Maya knows where I'm planning on working in, now it's time to actually start doing something. Now, before I start making anything, you'll notice this is just an empty scene inside of the program. Notice up here at the top, it says that it is an untitled file. That means that if I just start working right now and I get so swept up in being so brilliantly clever and creative, uh, I forget to save. What's going to likely happen? Well, hopefully your answer was it'll probably be a problem because if the computer crashes or if Maya crashes or if the power goes out um, or if anything happens to go wrong along the way, I will lose all of my work and we definitely don't want that to happen. So we're going to make sure that we save our scene and save often. Now because this is an unsaved file, I need to f come over to File and I can either choose Save Scene or Save As, but I like to do Save As. That's going to bring this option up and then I'm going to give this a name. Now I'll give it my last name, the class that I'm in, and then the assignment that I'm working on. And we have two options down here inside of the file types. Now at this point in your lessons, this really won't make that much of a difference, but I do want to make sure that you're aware of this. There is something called a Maya ASCII file, and then there is one called a Maya binary file. Both of these files contain 3D information, and so if you save it 
as one or the other, it likely won't make that big of a deal. However, just to let you know, binary means that the entire file is written in ones and zeros, and then the ASCII file is actually written with text. Okay, so at this point it doesn't matter and the default setting is binary, but in the future this might be something that you'd like to change and it's just important to remember which one you're doing. Now, I've given it a name, I've let it stay as a binary, and I'm simply going to hit save. Now the file itself, you can see, is going to be inside of my project, inside of the scenes folder, and there it is. Now, you can see at the end of my file, you can actually see that it is a .mb file. This may not be something that you can see depending on the computer you're working in. Now, depending on the version of my, or excuse me, the version of Windows that you're working on, this option inside of view, um, inside of the, uh, the folder options might be in a slightly different place, but what I'm trying to show you is this. Underneath the folder options, inside of view, there is an option right here called hide extensions for known file types. So inside of this, I would make sure that the hide extensions for known file types is checked off. That way, I'll always be able to see the end of the file so that I know what kind of file I'm really dealing with. All right, so now that I've set my project, now that I've saved my scene, now we can start actually working inside of the program. Now, it's a lot easier to see just exactly what all these different things that we're going to be doing. Um, it, it's easier to see how it works if we have something to actually work with. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to Create. I'm going to come underneath my Objects Options, and inside of this Polygon Primitive, I'm going to just choose a cube. And you can see that this little cube shows up in the middle of my scene. Now, if you have a mouse with a scroll wheel, you can use the scroll wheel to zoom into or out of that file. Notice that as I zoom in and out, I'm getting closer to or further away from that little object. If I'm too far away and the object is highlighted, if I just hit the F key, it will actually focus in on that object. Also notice that when it's highlighted in green, it means the object is selected. And if I select away from it, it is deselected. So if I highlight it, I can see all of the edges that make up this piece of geometry, and I can see each individual face just like that. So that's the first way I can get closer and further away. All right. The next way that we're going to be able to see our objects it requires two hands. So I'm going to hold down the Alt key, and then I'm going to use just the regular left click mouse button. So when I do that, watch what happens to my mouse. Do you see how it's changing the icon? This allows me to drag my mouse to the left or the right, and then turn around to see my object. Now, if I go down, I'll look above it. And if I look, push up, I'll look below it. But be careful, because right now I'm actually upside down, and it's hard to tell. But down here, you'll see this little, uh, this little XYZ navigator shows me that the Y is pointing down, which means I'm completely upside down. So what I need to do is go all the way around until I'm right side up again. Now, the next one that we're going to do is holding down the Alt key still, using the middle mouse scroll wheel, but I'm going to press down onto the scroll wheel as if it's a button. And when I do that, I get this. This is called strafing. Okay, If you've ever played a video game where you're trying to shoot at somebody and then run sideways, that's what strafing is. And you can see that I can move side to side. But notice that I'm not going around the object like I was when I hold down the left click button. Using the middle mouse, I'm just going side to side. So for example, if this object was over here or we had another one and I wanted to be able to look back and forth, that's what that's doing.
Okay? I can do the same thing also by looking or moving physically, moving up and down, just by pulling up and down. So a combination of these two things would be to go and look underneath and then say, you know what, I need a better view of this other side from this side. Now, this combination, this little use of your fingers, this is going to take practice. And so I can't stress this enough, you do need to practice doing this. Because until you can start maneuvering through the world, basically you're learning how to walk. Until you can really walk inside of this world, you'll always be taking those extra couple of steps trying to remember, wait, was it this button that I'm supposed to use or was it that other button? Eventually though, this is going to be just one of those things that becomes so comfortable that you'll be able to do this without even thinking about it. And that's exactly what you want. You want to be so comfortable using these button combinations that there is no question as to whether or not you're doing it right or wrong. That way you can use your brain power to focus on the important things like does my model look right? Is the model what I wanted? Is it going to work the way that I need it to? Those are all the creative and technical decisions. And the last thing you want is to use all your brain power trying to remember how to look at the object from the other side. Now, inside of this work window, you can see that as I highlight this, this window over here, by the way, is called the outliner. And if you do not see this outliner, this little button right here will turn it on and off. So as you see, this one is highlighted in blue. If I click off of it, that little outliner disappears. So you can decide whether or not you want the outliner visible. These are things that are going to be very helpful for you later. Uh, we're going to look at another way that you can keep things organized. Um, but with the outliner here, it's just a little easier for us to continue talking right now. So with this object selected, okay, I'm going to look at it. I can inspect it. And we're going to see just what this object is really made of. Okay. So as you can see, this object is called P cube 1. Now that means that it is polygon cube and the first one that was ever made in the scene. That's really the only thing that we have to work with inside of this window. If I use my right mouse button and hold down on this object, you'll see that I get this odd little selector window with this little pick whip. Okay, So this little line, and I'm still holding down as I'm moving my mouse around, I can move and choose different components of this object. Now a component is just something that is used to make this whole object. So if I first move over to, let's say, vertex, I'm going to release once it's highlighted. And notice that now my object is no longer green, it's actually highlighted in blue. What this means is that this object is in component mode. Now, in component mode, I can now select individual pieces that make up this object. So for example, notice that this over here is now highlighted in yellow. That means that the only thing that I have selected of this object is that one little corner point. Now I can't really do much right now because I'm simply inside of the selector menu tool. See this over here? This is what uh, the little arrow just means. This is you moving around and selecting things. But watch this. If I just move down to this little one with the arrows, this is the move tool. So if the move tool is highlighted, I get these little handles. And once I have a handle, I can just click and drag. And now I can change the shape of my object. Okay. Now, if this is back inside of this one, you don't have to come over to this menu set because there are some keys that you can use on the keyboard to do this quickly. It makes your work a lot faster. They're called hot keys. Okay? So if I want to go into the move tool, I'm actually going to choose the W key. Now I know that's a little strange. Like why is the word move uh, using the W key? Well, it actually has nothing to do with uh, the key itself. It's, it's more or less where it is on the keyboard. 
So watch this. If I just tap the W key, there I'm inside of my Move tool. Now, if I tap the Q T, which is right next to it, the Q key goes back to just being that regular selector. So the W gives me the Move tool. The Q key gives me the arrow. Now, there are other tools, but we can't really do much with just one point. So why don't we try to select multiple points? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight over one of them. You can see I've got that one selected. And I'm going to shift and select the second one right over there. Now, as you can see, I have two points selected. They're both highlighted in yellow. So if I use the W key again, now I can move two of those points at the same time. And I can choose which direction I want to move it in. And I can change the shape. Okay. But now that I have something that, that has some shape to it, if I hit the E key, now I have a rotation tool. So watch this. If I wanted to rotate, I could just grab hold of one of the colored handles. And remember, RGB is XYZ. So R, G, B is X, Y, and Z. So if I grab hold of one and start turning, you can see that I'm now rotating those two points around. Now I'm just going to undo that for a second. So let's review so far. We've got Q, which is just a selection, W, which allows me to move things around, and then E, that lets me rotate. So the last one that we're going to look at is the R key, and that's to scale. So watch this. If I just choose one of these directions, the blue, which would be the, remember, RGB is X, Y, Z, so blue is Z. And I'm just going to drag that, and look at that. I'm scaling away, or I can scale in. Okay. Now, obviously, I can't scale up and down, because they're basically in the same place. Same thing with the X key. They really aren't going anywhere. But I can also use all of these tools on the object itself, not just on the component. But first, I have to get out of component mode. I have to get back into object mode. And I do that by right clicking on the object again and just moving up to object mode. And notice that it's highlighted in green now to let me know that I'm now selecting the whole object. And notice that because I was already on the, uh, the scale tool, I'm still using the scale tool, only now I'm scaling the entire object instead of just pieces. So this is one of the easiest ways that you can quickly manipulate one of these objects. Now you've seen that in the XYZ, right, RGB is XYZ, that I can hold down to a single handle and I'll go in one direction. But what if I want to scale the whole thing at the same time? Well, that's what this universal middle button is for. So if I just select in there and drag, now I can make the entire thing bigger or the entire thing smaller. So I can also, if I, I'm using right now the scale tool, which again was the R key, I can rotate it by going into my E key, and I can now quickly rotate it into a position. I can also move it using the W key. I can move it into position. I can put it into a different place, and I can start to set things up if this is where I wanted it to go. All right. Hit F. And I'll quickly zoom in on that object that I'm looking at. By the way, this is actually really useful. Let's say that the object that I'm working on is way over there. And otherwise, I'd have to sort of maneuver and then start zooming in. Or I can just select it, hit F, focuses, frames right in. And it goes exactly where I want it to. OK? So, so far what we've looked at is um, using the manipulation tools creating a polygon object, and that the polygon objects are made out of multiple components, different parts. Now, so far, we've only, if I right click again, we've only looked at the vertex. Let's take a look at the faces. So when I move down into the faces mode, you can see that as, as I move my mouse around, one face will highlight. Now, this is very useful, because if I just click on it, 
you can see that that is now the face that I have and I can manipulate it and I can E key rotate it and I can W key scale it right now I'm gonna go back into the object mode real quick because I would like to do something there's an option inside of Maya that I I really prefer when I'm inside of my faces options notice that I can select the face by highlighting over any part of it okay I can just grab this tiny little piece or if I'm selecting across multiple ones I can select multiple faces at the same time the problem though is that sometimes especially when I'm doing some real sophisticated modeling I would really prefer to be able to control exactly which faces that I'm selecting and so this is just my own personal preference you do not have to do this if you don't want to but you'll be seeing a lot of my videos with this option on so I'm inside of the Windows option I'm gonna go down into my settings and preferences I'm gonna go to my preferences tab and that's gonna bring up this big window now I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit until I find selection right there and about halfway down this menu there is the polygon selection option notice that right now it says whole face you can also choose center so if I hit save notice that all of a sudden not only do I have whole faces visible but I can now select and I can be much more sophisticated very very sneaky I can be very precise about which faces I'm selecting because I have to select it from the center now you might be saying well why in the world would you want to do that that seems like a little extra work well that brings me to this next option right now we're looking at this object in shaded mode meaning that we can see whole solid faces well if I hit the number four key I can go into wireframe now the object didn't suddenly become transparent it's just how I'm looking at my object and by the way these little buttons are right up here so this is wireframe this is shaded view okay so if I'm inside of wireframe notice that you can actually see the faces behind other faces so this right here that's the face here but if I'm looking at it through I don't know if I'm going to select that but with that option on if I go back to my settings and preferences and I go to my selection if whole faces is turned on notice that I can't not select this one so that means that if I'm looking through my object I can't quickly grab things on the other side now like I said that might not be something that you're really all that interested in right now but as somebody who's been using this program for a really long time I have found that being able to control faces by selecting even through another object makes my life a lot easier okay now since we know how we can control the shapes of certain objects we can now start to shape things exactly the way that we want to so notice that by simply selecting one of these faces I can drag in one direction I can drag in the other direction okay now remember I'm inside of component mode so I'm gonna right click again and go to object mode so that I can move the entire object around okay now I'm looking at this view through this one single perspective view I can change this by looking at multiple views or a different view and one of the easiest ways to see it from different angles is to simply tap the space bar when your mouse is inside of one of these windows so if I tap the space bar now see that I can see things from different views at the same time in fact this is the only actual perspective view I have to work in this is a top view you can see that right here so this is like a blueprint I'm only looking straight down at objects this is a front view so once again I'm only looking at it straight on and then this is the side view now watch what happens if I move this up and down you can see that only some of the windows are showing that you see how as I move it up and down 
this one doesn't seem to be changing much at all. Why is this one not changing? Well, that's because I'm looking at it as a top view, so moving things up and down won't affect that view at all. But moving things side to side will, but notice that because that's the direction that my camera is looking, it doesn't seem to be changing at all either. Okay? Now, again, this is going to take a little bit of uh, practice to understand and, and to really be comfortable with all this. Um, but when you're doing your first assignment, which is going to be to design and model a simple um, maze, that starting from the top view may make your life a lot easier because you're looking straight down at it. And then as you continue working, you can start looking at it from different angles. Okay? Now, let's say that you've made this object and you like this object, but you want to make a set of walls all the way around. You want to make a border for your maze. Well, if it's going to use the same object, I can duplicate this object. I can make two of them simply by selecting the object and using Control D. And now I can have two objects. Now, let's say that I want a wall on this side and I want a wall on that side. I can duplicate it. And now, if I use my E key, I can rotate it into position. Now, mazes usually need a starting point and an ending point. So I'll leave one little area blank and I will select my vertex points or faces. You can do this with either one. And notice that because I have those little centers selected, now that I'm looking at it from the side, uh, the, from the top view, I'm only selecting that one face. This is what I meant when I said this is just something that I have learned is the way that I like to work. So I now have a second one, duplicate it again, slide it over, and then I can push it to the other direction. So now I have an entrance and an exit. Now I'm not saying you have to do this just like me, but this is going to really help you in designing your world. Now, can you imagine being in a maze that is that short? I think what we might want to do is make our walls taller. So I've selected all of my objects at the same time, and now I'm making tall walls. And if I use my five key, I can now see those walls are solid. Okay. Now, I've made some good progress. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that I save my scene. Because up until now, the computer has only remembered that I've made a file, but none of my work has actually been saved. So I just come over to File, and I make sure that I go to my Save Scene. Now, this is really important. When we're using Maya, Maya likes to use a lot of system resources. In other words, it works the computer. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you what this little option box does. Okay, so in each one of these, whenever you see these little boxes, it means that some options exist beyond just this button. So I'm going to open up the option box, and there's this really great setting right here, and it says to use incremental save. Now, an incremental save means that it will continue to save, but it's also going to make a backup of a previous version of this file for me. Now, if you're using a thumb drive and you don't have a lot of space, you can limit the number of incremental saves. Okay? Now, when you do this, Instead of just a single file, you're going to get an extra folder in here. So watch this. I'm just going to bring this over to the side so that we can see what happens here. All right. So with or without the limitation, this is going to still work. Okay. But with the incremental save, when I say Save Scene, watch what happens over here. All right. So I click on Save Scene. And right over here, this whole new folder has popped up. Now this file is what we're currently looking at. But if I had a different version, maybe something with less than the progress that I've made, it will be sitting inside of my incremental save. Notice that this folder represents 
this file. So inside of the incremental saves, I can open it up. And here is my first backup of my project. This is going to save you a lot of time, especially because Maya files really do put pressure on a computer, especially if the computer isn't really, really powerful. So if you're doing any of this work at home, maybe on a computer that's a few years old, or maybe simply a computer that's not built to, to handle this kind of stuff, you can still work, but you really have to be careful because all of these saves, without them, if one thing goes wrong with that one file that you have right here, if this was your only project file and something went wrong, what would you do? You'd have to start all over because the file gets corrupted or maybe it didn't save quickly enough. Now, I just want to make sure you understand. It's because the computers are being taxed based on what it is you're doing. In fairly simple scenes, this is likely not going to happen nearly as much. But it's important to start getting into this habit because if you're not in this habit when it really starts to count, that's when things go wrong. Right? It's Murphy's Law. So the one thing to keep in mind is to always make sure that when you're going to save your file, when you go over to File, go to Save Scene, but go over to the Option box and just make sure that this is checked on. If you're working on someone else's computer, you can never just assume that all of these settings are going to be correct exactly the way that you want them every single time. It's just not going to happen. Okay? So, I'm going to just hit cancel because I don't need to save again right now. But let's talk a little bit about starting to organize your work because now that I have multiple objects here, you can see that I have several different objects. They each have a different name and it's just starting to fill up this list. Now, there's another place that you can see all of your objects. Some people like using the outliner. Other people like using this other window, which is inside of Windows General Editors, and it's inside of this window called the Hypergraph Hierarchy. Now, this is a floating window, and you have to be real careful with floating windows, especially when you first start Maya. Because watch this, if I move my mouse over, do you see how it's trying to dock inside of these different windows? If I if I'm not careful, it's going to lock this floating window into my workspace. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to make sure that that does not happen. And this is something that you probably want to make sure is set because otherwise you're just going to start docking and undocking windows by accident. So underneath windows, inside of workspaces, just go all the way down to the bottom to where it says disable the docking and undocking. So when I click this, notice that if I tried, now it's not going to let me dock this. And that means that this little window I can bring up when I need it to. I can have it off to anywhere I need in the scene. But it's not going to accidentally dock just because I was trying to move something over. All right. Now, as you can see, inside of the outliner, I have one, two, three, and four P cubes. And inside of the hypergraph, I have one, two, three, and four P cubes. Now, the one thing that I want to note is that inside of the outliner, you can see things that you wouldn't normally see over here. Notice that in, if I'm just zooming out using my scroll wheel, I don't have all of these invisible cameras. And you can tell it's invisible because it's faded out. These are the views that are inside of my scene. There's also default object sets and default light sets. The outliner has information that normally isn't going to be visible inside of the hy hypergraph hierarchy. Now, it's entirely up to you. You can use one or the other, or you can use them both. But I usually use the hypergraph simply because it's a window that can pop up, I can see my objects that I've made it in my scene, and then I can simply shrink the window down and bring it back up when I need it. Now, there's two different things that you can do with objects to make them work together as a team. Okay? The first thing that you can do is you can select multiple objects 
and you can group them together. So watch what happens if I select these two objects and I'm going to use the hotkey for Control G to group the objects together. Notice that now I have this thing called Group 1 and if I move Group 1 around these two objects behave as if they're one. But notice that they are in fact still separate objects. So I'm just going to undo so that it goes back. Now, grouping is really useful because the objects themselves are still free and you can do whatever you need to. There's another thing that you can do, and I'm going to use these two as an example, and it's called parenting. Now, parenting means that one object becomes sort of a subservient to the other. Okay, so notice that this group inside of this you can see that it's connected. These two objects are under the control of this group. Well I can make one object under the control of another. So watch this, if I use my middle mouse drag, okay, so I'm clicking down the, the scroll wheel, I'm now going to parent it to the other one. And when I do that, look what happens. See, unlike this, where the group is this new thing, this object now knows that it is listening to the one object. And notice that when I select it in my scene, the other one, the one that is a child of the parent, is now under the control. And anything that I do works to f affect the other one. Now you might be asking yourself, why would there be two different versions of, you know, essentially the same act? And the real reason is because depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish, um, you might want to choose one way or the other. Now, as a simple rule of thumb, it might be a better idea to go with groups. The reason being is that each one of these objects still remains its own object whereas this object is now kind of having no choice but to listen to the other object. All right. Now, to unparent, in other words, take the child and get it out from the influence of the other, it's going to be a hotkey, or you can use this, inside of my, again, on my mouse, using my middle mouse, I'm clicking down, and if I just click away and let go, notice that this object has jumped out of the influence of this one. All right, so grouping versus parenting. Okay, now what if I wanted these objects to also be part of that group? I can simply use that same action using the clicking the middle mouse button and just say, I want you to be a part of that group and I want you to be a part of that group too. Notice that now we have one group containing all four of my objects. So organizing my scene is going to be very important, but something else that'll be important is to give these objects much better names than P cube one and group one. So what I'm actually gonna do and by the way, if you see this over here, you just need to use, excuse me, you need to use the, if you see the attributes sitting over here, you just need to go into what's known as the channel box. That's what this is right here. If you already see this, that's okay. Something else that you can do, a hotkey to cycle through these, is to hold down control and tap the A key. So notice that I'm inside of this. This is the attribute editor. That is where you see all of the information that makes up this object. And if I hold control A again, I go right back to the channel box, okay? Now, from here, I'm going to give this wall a very specific name. And you can see that right now it's just called P cube one. Doesn't help me very much. I'm gonna call this outer wall 01, okay? And I'm just gonna hit enter. Notice that by changing the name here, I have also changed the name here. 
Now, I can do the same thing with the next one, but instead of changing it up in the channel box, I can simply right click on it in the hypergraph and say I want to rename it, and now I can rename it here. I'm gonna call this Outer Wall 2 and hit enter. So as you can see, Outer Wall 2 is now listed in the channel box, and Outer Wall 2 is listed in the hypergraph, and of course, Outer Wall 2 would also be listed right inside the outliner. So, I'm not saying that you have to use every single one of these, but knowing that they all exist is probably a good thing. I'm gonna right click here, excuse me. I'm, just, I'm going to double click carefully in the text, and I'm going to name it Outer Wall underscore 03 and hit enter. So I'm renaming these. I can rename them here, I can rename them here, and I can rename them here. It's really whichever one you prefer as you're working because they're all going to listen regardless, okay? Now, because all of these inside of the group are outer walls, what should, what should we name the main group? How about outer wall GR? P to say that that is the group. All right, so now that each one of these objects has been properly created, properly named, and properly positioned, now I can start modeling and making new objects for my scene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over to my Create Tools. I'm going to choose Polygons again, but this time I'm going to make a cylinder. I'm going to move this up so you can see it. And I'm going to choose the R key so I can scale it. I'm going to make it nice and tall. And then I'm going to move it into position, and I think I can look at it from the top view. That's going to be easy for me. And I can put it right here. And if I think to myself, ah, eh, it might be a little bit too tall, so let me just grab, remember, right click, go to vertices, grab it, and pull it down. And then right click on it again to go back to object mode, so I can select the whole object, I can duplicate it, and I'm going to put the copy, the duplicate, to the other side. Everybody see that? So, I can make multiple objects very quickly, but I'm going to delete that object because I'm not done yet. I'm going to make a new object simply by choosing to make, oh, we'll just do a cone for now. Okay, so there's my cone. I'm going to make it nice and tall. I'm going to put it right above the other object. And now I have this little turret. Now, there's a couple of different things I could do. I could grab hold of one and then the other object and try to move it around, or I can actually group them together so that they act as one. I could parent one object to the other, or if I know that these two objects need to pretend to be one object forever, I can actually do something called combining. So. I'm going to bring up my hypergraph so you guys can see what's about to happen. I'm going to select the two objects that I want to combine, and then I'm going to choose Mesh, and then right here, Combine. Now when I do that, you'll see something very odd has just happened, both inside of the outliner and inside of the hypershade. Now inside of this window, if I select one or the other object, it's as if I'm selecting one, but what on earth is all of this extra information? This is history. Now, this object knows that it has been united. It has been joined together with a polygon cylinder and a polygon cone. This is the new object, but this is the original cone, and this is the original cylinder. And because I haven't done something really, really important, all of this excess is going to be there until I say I don't need it anymore. So when I combine an object, when I know that the work that I have done is good and I am done with that history, that input here, I need to select the object underneath Edit, go to Delete by type and choose delete history. Now when I click this button, watch what happens over here. Notice that all of that excess history 
has suddenly disappeared. In fact, even on the object itself in the channel box, all of those different inputs are gone also. That means that as far as Maya is concerned, this is the way the object has always been. And it's important to remember that unless that kind of history is absolutely necessary, because there really is such a thing as good history, but you don't have to worry about things like that when you're just starting to model. It's unnecessary. So in most cases, you'll be deleting history quite a lot, okay? So now that I've made my little tower here, I'm going to name it Tower and hit Enter. And now that I have this one single object, I'm going to duplicate it and then move it over. And there it is. Now, I've made some changes and I don't want to lose this information, so I'm going to hit Control S or I can come over to File and choose Save Scene. I can also come over to the Option box and make absolutely sure that Incremental Saves is turned on and I can say Save the Scene. Now, let's say for example, uh, obviously we're not done with this yet, but let's just say that we've made some extra progress and we would really like to just make this look a little bit nicer. We can start to color our objects and make them look unique. So, up here in this little menu, you'll see this odd little, it looks almost like an eyeball, but this is an icon that will take you to this crazy big window, it's called the Hyper Shade. This is actually where we can create whole new surface shaders that will give us different colors for our objects. Now, I'm going to make sure everybody sees this. I'm going to stick inside of this area called Maya, and inside of the Maya, I'm going to choose Surface, and then these are some of the types of surfaces we can use. Now because this is one of the very first times we've ever seen this, I'm going to keep things really simple. If we're looking for something that basically does not have shine, I want you to choose a Lambert. Okay? If you want something that is kind of shiny, I want you to choose a Blin. Alright? So, for right now, those are the only two we're going to focus on. So I'm going to make one Blin, and you'll see that inside of this little window, I have a new shader and then we have some extra information. Now, this blin has a color setting. If I click on it, it's going to bring up this wheel and I can choose any color of the rainbow. All right. The nice thing about a blin is it is in fact a shiny shape. So it's going to give me some of that nice highlight stuff um, when we start talking about lighting and later on we'll even get into uh, rendering with reflections and this is just a really really great thing to do. But how in the world do I get this onto that? Right? So notice that I just have my floating window here. I can do this several different ways. If I choose the object itself I can simply right click and say assign the material to what I have selected. So if I write, if I do that, now you can see that that color has highlighted. If I want to do the same thing to this one, instead of using that same method, I can actually use the middle mouse button, the same thing we were doing to uh, parent objects, and I can just drag it and then release onto that object. You can see that I can change the color that way too. So I now have two objects. They're nice and shiny and I've chosen a color. Now let's say, for example, you're not entirely happy with that color. You just want to make some changes. Well, you can always do that back inside of here, and all of that information will update. So watch this. Just going to make this window just a little bit smaller so it fits on the screen here. So if I choose a different color, notice that all those colors update on my objects. Okay. Now, let's say that I want the outer walls to be a different color, but I just don't want them to be shiny. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to use a Lambert. So I'll choose a new Lambert, and as you can see here, it's starting to get a little, a little crowded in my workspace. So I'm going to choose the Lambert that I want to work with. 
And I'm just going to choose this one little button right here. This says show me the inputs and outputs, but what it also does is it kind of clears my workspace of everything else. Notice that I didn't delete the green. It's still here. It's just not part of my workspace right now. So I'm going to choose a new color for that. Let's make it maybe like a, a sandstone color. And then I can select multiple objects, right click and say assign to what I have selected. And there we go. So let's say that I want to have some kind of a ground plane. So I'll choose a plane and I'll scale it out. And then I'll move some things into position. You can see that right now, since I've been moving things around a lot, a lot of these are not actually touching the ground. So I'll just bring them down. And now they are touching the ground. I can choose to make this a new color if I want. I can just bring back my hypershade and I can choose maybe another Lambert. And why not? Let's just make it sort of a forest green color. So I can, with my new shader, I can middle mouse drag to that one object, and there we go. So from here, I could continue making new objects, or I can duplicate uh, some of these walls, so I could continue making uh, some new divisions inside of the middle. What I can also do is I can take pieces, and I can reshape them, and make them anything else that I want. So a lot of times, mazes aren't just a single layer, maybe they're multiple layers. So in order to get out, maybe I need to go up a set of stairs. So let's make a set of stairs. I can just start with this one shape that I've created, duplicate it, control D, slide it over, scale it down, duplicate it again, slide it over, Maybe I can choose the top face and scale down. And remember, we're using very, very simple methods for doing this. As we get further along, we'll be able to do more and more complex modeling. But for right now, I think we're doing OK with what we've got. So with what we've seen in this video, you shouldn't have any problems getting your uh, maze done and Hopefully this has been a, a big help to you. Good luck working with your uh, uh, newfound skills and enjoy.